and welcome to PodCash, the portable professional development podcast from Cash. Thanks for joining us. My name's Dawn and I'm the editor of Cash Alumni. And this week we're joined by Stephen Mordew, who's a senior social work lecturer at the University of Sunderland. Stephen writes for Cash Alumni, covering loads of different bits of legislation. Um, and this week we're going to talk a little bit about self-care and all of the different ways it's important to embed it into your practice. Stephen, thanks for having me. Um, it's really nice to be here in your office. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what it is that you do now? Uh, okay, so I'm a, a, a lecturer at uh, Sunderland University on the social work programme there. And uh, in the main, I, I teach the kind of adult care side of things um, because my background was in only person services as a social worker, then as a team manager. Um, so a lot of my work was, was around uh, dementia care, uh, you know, working with, with, working with older people. Um, as part of my job when I was working for the, the council, um, I was also a practice educator, so I used to kind of train on the job, social ways, if you like, when the wrong place were with us. Um, and that, I guess, was a bit of a catalyst to, uh, to think, and well, it might be interesting to make a career out of the teaching side of it, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, so I then applied for uh, a job at the university thinking this will be a great opportunity to test out my interview skills because I hadn't done an interview for ages and uh, went and got the job so I ended up uh, I ended up at the university so like I said teaching the adult care stuff but also I'm practice learning coordinator there so I um, I, I organise all the placements for students and that's really good because it gets you out and about and it gets you seeing what's going on in social care and, and social work organisations so I really kind of enjoy that aspect, that aspect of the role. Um, alongside that, because uh, I do that for part of the week, and the other part of the week, um, I, I write because I enjoy writing. Uh, it's a bit of a passion of mine. Um, and you so, write for us. And I write for so I write for Cash Alumni um, around uh, social care, uh, social work, and, and kind of self care, those kind of things. I do those, and I also run my own uh, blog, Social Work Shorts, um, because I think there's a real kind of need there to bridge the gap between kind of academic literature and kind of a more kind of blog journalistic kind of approach to it. I think there's a a, a gap in the middle there where what you're writing about is rooted in academic literature and research but is written in a very kind of accessible way and that's kind of what I try to achieve in what I write for you. Yeah and I think what what we see is that you're you're really good at making things relevant to real life whereas it's not just books you're talking mm. about how things work yeah. actually yeah. in the things that our audience will have mm. come across in, mm. their, in their day-to-day what would you say that sort of challenges are facing those social work students who are going into social work from a classroom setting or just generally in the sector what are the sort of challenges people are are, are facing um I, I think there's 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 always a challenge um of transferring the classroom learning into into the real world i think that is difficult um, that's what attracted me to the practice educator role, training people in, in, in the job place. Um, students need to carry with them into practice that idea of theoretical ideas and research. Uh, because if they don't root their practice in those kind of things, then they're just doing what they think they should do and being well-meaning about what they do and how they support people. Uh, um, so I think they've always got to have an eye on why am I doing this the way I'm doing it? And that's rooted in research and theoretical ideas. But that trans- that transition, translating that into practice, is quite difficult. And there's a tendency to kind of leave that behind and get on with the job. You know, so we well, this is how we do the job. You, you can leave behind the classroom and you can't. It's got to kind of work together. And I think that's that's where some of the things that are right I hope hopefully help because it does try and sit some of the some of the academic stuff, some of the theoretical ideas um, in, into the kind of real workplace. Um, but but beyond that, um, I think one of the, the big challenges is, is just figuring out how to um, manage as a social worker, working with people who are often um, in the midst of crisis or having a difficult time of life. So working in the midst of that and dealing with that emotional aspect of the job while making sure you look after yourself and care for yourself and also how do you figure out how do you keep control of all the stuff that you need to do 
that wasn't the stuff that motivated you to come into the profession, like hitting time scales, hitting deadlines, keeping things within budget. I'm going to hazard a guess that there's probably nobody sat in first, second or third year social work degrees who thinks, who, who's come from a perspective where their motivation was to manage budgets, write reports, hit a deadline. It's strange to you know, it, 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 it would be an odd one, it would be an odd one. They came into it because they've got this um, internal drive, this intrinsic motivation to want to um, offer themselves, I think, and I think that's what that's kind of social work's kind of unique contribution I guess that social workers tend to offer of themselves and they take on people's emotions they take on people's problems and then help people kind of figure out a way through those problems and is that a reason that, that maybe burnout's quite so big an issue within not just social work yeah. but social care in general yeah absolutely and, and I think yeah I think the, 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 the problem the problem is that if you are constantly taking on other people's emotions, constantly taking on the, um, the, 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 the negatives in people's life, people trying to overcome difficulties and overcome problems, um, you first of all you have quite a skewed view of the world because you're only dealing with people who are, are in crisis or in, in difficulties and actually the people that are in those situations are probably a relatively small percentage of the population but you get a skewed view of it. Um, but equally it, it, it saps on your kind of um, emotional capacity to survive and thrive in other parts of your life, you know? So if you're constantly given emotionally to the people that you're working with or taking on their emotions, where have you got the emotion left for your relationship at home or your relationship with your children or your parents or, you know, or your friends, all that kind of stuff? Just life in general. Just life yes. in general. How do you get on with life in general? So... Um, what I think people need to self-care um, in such a way that their work life and their home life are kind of interrelated in a sense that you need to be kind of doing well in both, you know? So when self-care is sort of a, a dirty word, it, it's something that, that people don't like to talk about because mm -hmm. it seems selfish to mm -hmm. self-care mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. Where do you think people can embed that or make it a priority? What, what do you think is the sort of missing link between putting those things together? I, 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 think, the, the, I think the missing link isn't missing anymore. I think the, the missing link was an understanding of how we work, how, how our psychology kind of works, how our brains work, um, what the impact on us psychologically is of... Um, taken on board people's emotions um, not being organised so you keep missing things how that makes you feel, all of those kind of things so I think there's lots of things that we now know because particularly probably kind of since the 70s since, since our ability to kind of look at the brain in action has really developed over that last 30 or 40 years so we can now see what's going on when people are making decisions, when people are under pressure, when people are stressed, we can see what's going on and we can figure out what things kind of actually work. The problem is, when I talk to people about self-care, I'll talk to people about going for a walk for 20 minutes on a lunchtime. The impact but that lunch can time have. lunchtime is where I type up my case notes and, and uh, how, uh, I, how I spend... Absolutely. You know, so, well, it, and you hit the nail right on the head there. That's a problem. So you say to practitioners, what you need to do at lunchtime is take 20 minutes, go for a walk, have something healthy and nutritious to eat it's not going to weigh you down all afternoon um, do that and you'll be more productive in the afternoon there's research that says that we know we know that that's that's a, a fact yeah. as far as we can we can see it's a fact that if you take that time out you'll, you'll get more done in the afternoon and you'll get so much more done in the afternoon it will more than compensate for the 20 minutes that you've lost but persuading someone to do that who's who's um, overwhelmed and stressed by the job that they're doing to persuade them to do that they're going no that can't be right just taking it just going for a walk for 20 minutes is not going to improve all of this work that i have to do and you kind of well yeah. it is you know and you've got a conflict as well between what the know to be right because you might know that it's going to make you more productive mm. but you've got that culture of presenteeism as well Absolutely. so if you're in an organisation where actually the culture is everybody mm. just cracks on and gets yeah. through their dinner hour so mm. that they can get home on time yeah. do you think that in terms of the sector as a whole is something that's changing yeah. or no I think it's I think it's very real and, and, and I know this because um, when um, I teach some of this self care stuff to students while they're with us in university 
and uh, so then I ask them when they're out in practice, how are you doing with lunch, oh we don't get a lunch break, well, what did I tell you though in class, what did I show you, what research did I show you that said this is positive, so you're right, organisational culture is probably the thing that shifts people from being intrinsically motivated to want to do a good job and, and, and help and support people and empower people to then being motivated by the external factors of I don't dare go for a lunch break because if I go for a lunch break what's that going to make me look like it's going to make me lose up I've got enough to do you know so it's going to people are going to perceive me negatively then because we all should be working so hard that we have to arrive at work at seven o'clock in the morning and not leave till seven o'clock in the night and not have a lunch break you know well actually there's very strong evidence that says by shortening your working day by working on how to stop yourself procrastinating working on all of that actually you can shorten your work and you can shorten your working day and still get as much done if you've got a system um, for doing that but how we overturn that it is is a difficult one and really I think if we're going to teach anybody about um, how the psychology of productivity works we have to be starting with management so that management are going round the office on the lunch time and going, this is the third day in a row I've seen you sat at your desk, get out and get a lunch break, go and take some time out. I think people need permission to kind of do that, yeah? Now, the 20 minute lunch break isn't a panacea for all the failings in social care and social work. There are, there are deeply entrenched problems. I think it's important to say that. There are deeply entrenched problems um, in terms of lack of funding, lack of resources, not enough not enough soldiers on the ground. There's all of those problems which well, are very even real. Even within health and social care in terms of care homes, domiciliary care, that at any time there's upwards of 150,000 unfilled yeah, vacancies. Absolutely. Does that translate into social work? Is is there a shortage of social workers as well as some of those? Mm. I mean, definitely my understanding from what, from what I've read is particularly in kind of uh, areas like child protection. Um, there, there are, uh, everybody's carrying vacancies. Um, there's also a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, people, um, contractors, kind of working in these environments where they they kind of there for a, a six month contract and then they kind of leave, and then you're not getting the continuity of care that I think is is required. You know, um, there are, there are some quite uh, problematic statistics around how many times children who are in the look after system are either moved homes that they live in or moved social workers and all all that goes with that. You know. Um, all the damage that that, that, that does um, but how do you change that in a sector um, where everywhere's carrying vacancies so, so yeah it, it's, it's a real problem um, I don't know the exact figures but from what I see maybe the problems are, uh, are less in, in adult care um, I know from my experience anyway when I was a, a social worker the adult care teams were fairly static you know um, and I think we need to explore why that is, because um, particularly since uh, since we the inception of the the Mental Capacity Act, which brought a whole wave of other responsibilities um, into the social work world, changes in the Care Act to kind of get used to the development of personalisation. Since we've had all of those things, that certainly shifted um, the demands in adult care. Yet, from what I see. Um, those teams are still a lot more static than child protection teams are. So I think we need to kind of, there needs, somebody needs to have a look at that and try and figure out why that is. Um, because fundamentally, the people working in those sectors are probably dealing with similar things, emotional situations, um, you know, children, it's not just children who are abused, it's older adults, it's people with learning disabilities, it's all that kind of thing. So I think there is a lot of similarities between these areas. Um, I mean, even in terms of the, the, the pressures as we get an, an, an older population, yeah. people's case loads get bigger, and yeah. finances in local authorities are yeah. being squeezed, yeah. I mean, do you think that'll even the playing field a little I, bit? Or? I, I, think, I think it's hard to talk about an even playing field, because I think... Um, while, while at the core we're doing similar things, um, the reasons people come to those sorts of social work are generally quite different. So people are involved in child protection because um, their children are at risk and I've never worked in child protection and I 
can't begin to comprehend what it must feel like to go into a family home and have to remove the children. That's always that's always going to be negative, surely. It's got to be. Whereas my experience of, of working with all the people was in the main, people were quite pleased you were there. The problems were quite difficult and it didn't come without its challenges in terms of kind of, you know, managing conflict within families and all that kind of stuff. It, you know, those those challenges are there. But overall, it was providing solutions. Generally, yeah, you were trying to help people work through those problems and provide solutions. Um, so it comes to those challenges. One of the things that I'm always saying to students um, is, is don't get caught up in adult social work being a kind of poor relation to turning to children's social work. You're going to just need different sorts of things. And the key skill, I think, in social work with adults is negotiation. You're going to have to be like Kofi and I. You're going to be have to kind. Of, you're going to have to have those negotiation skills at the fore of your kind of um, thinking all the time. How am I going to work my way through this while trying to keep everybody on board? We have all the different ideas about what, what should happen to mom. Should she be in a care home? Should she be supported at home? Should she live in a different place? Well, actually, it could just be. Well, does mom? Well, well, exactly, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. All and, and you're, so you're managing all of that. But it, it's it's interesting you mention that because it, it's an interesting thing about older age, isn't it? That um, an older person has been the decision maker in their in their world all of their lives, and suddenly they've got maybe early onset dementia or their physical health failing, and suddenly sons and daughters start to feel a kind of right to kind of make decisions. And suddenly, when as the practitioner you're telling them it's not their right to make that decision, it's still mum or dad's right. Um, and actually, think about the Mental Capacity Act. If it isn't mum or dad's right to make that decision because they lack the capacity to make that decision it then becomes my decision as the social worker, albeit taking your voice into account. That's where you need the negotiation, because that never goes down Obviously, very I'm well. quite lucky because I get to read all of the things that you yeah. write for us for Cash Alumni, so I know that you've done a lovely series for us sort of exploring the, mm. the Mental Capacity Act mm. and sort of legislation in general and how that relates to real life practice. Yeah. Um, could you explain a little bit about what the Mental Capacity Act is? Because not all of our audience listening to the podcast right. will be a social care audience or a, or, okay. or a social worker audience. Um, we'll have people listening who work in early years education, um, who are interested in the sector in general, may work in, in, in schools, colleges, training okay. providers. What is the Mental Capacity Act, if you, if you had to explain it in as few words as possible? <laughs> right, okay. Well, I can't do that. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a lecturer who tends to go off at tangents on a regular basis. Yeah, so this could, a full series. This, so, this could, so this could end up anywhere. But essentially, the Mental Capacity Act uh, was a piece of legislation that we've waited for for a long time. So I'll just I'll create you a quick scenario. You're on a hospital ward. Um, you've got an 82-year-old um, patient in bed. Um, they have some element of dementia and they're physically frail so they're at risk when they mobilise. Consultant says to said person and family, mum needs to be in care. The social worker comes along and says, actually I've talked to mum and I think she could make this decision for herself. Pre-Mental Capacity Act, we're stuck because there's no mechanism for us to um, assert the rights of the individual or if the individual can't make a decision for themselves to then have a debate with the family and the consultant about what we should do that's in this person's best interests. So we were very much stuck in that hierarchy of consultants know best for patients who are in hospital beds. So can you social worker, can you just get on with it please because we've told you what needs to happen. Very much stuck in that kind of, that kind of thing. So when the Mental Capacity Act came along, it gave us a framework for primarily, and, and this should always be the priority, is supporting people to make their own decisions. How can we how can we make sure that the person can make the decision for themselves? And once we've ascertained that maybe they can't make this particular decision for themselves, what do we do in order to make that decision? Um, so that and just just what you've just said there was really interesting right. because I think for me when I first started looking at the stuff that you were writing um, I had a very brief foray into a social work degree um, but I am in no way physically fit enough to be a social worker <laughs> um, at, you know the Mental Capacity Act and, and the stuff that I'd read around it I'd sort of taken that as a there's a judgement made this person has capacity and can make their own decisions or this person does not have capacity and cannot make their own decisions 
what I've picked up from the stuff that I've read that you've written for Cash Alumni is actually yep. that that's a decision by decision basis. Absolutely. Is, is that that, yeah. that somebody can have capacity to make a decision mm -hmm. even if they're not capable of making general decisions about where they live or, or what they're yeah. doing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, we all make decisions all the time, don't we? I mean, you know, if you think about the amount of decisions you will have just made today, you know. You'll have made a decision to get up and come to work. You'll have made a decision to kind of to dress the way you've dressed. You'll have made a decision about what to have for lunch. Those kind of those kind of decisions, and some of those sorts of decisions aren't problematic, you know. So, um, if you want to go to work in your pajamas, then that's not really going to cause any great sorts of problems for you. Do you know what I mean? So, there, there's a layer. There's not a great deal of risk in that, if you like, um, or or you want to. Um, Want to overindulge at lunchtime and eat more than you know, eat more than maybe you'd want to on a daily basis. Um, th th so there's there's decisions like that that are just kind of routine daily decisions that some people lack capacity to make, and we should think about. So if someone wants to eat cream cakes all the time when they're diabetic and they don't understand the impact of the cream cakes on, on their diabetes, well maybe we need to make a decision around that. But then you've got a whole other tier of decisions um, around where shall I live and am I safe doing this, that or the other. There are all sorts of serious decisions like that. Um, who's going to look after my money for me? You know, Who's going to look after my finances? Those kind of decisions. And that's where we needed some sort of framework particularly to kind of and make sure people are kept safe. Some of that you mentioned about cream cakes and diabetes yeah. and, and what you said was that that person doesn't, if that person doesn't understand the impact of cream cakes yeah. on their diabetes, does that mean that it would be different if somebody did understand the impact of cream Absolutely. cakes on their diabetes Absolutely. but still wanted to eat them, it yeah. would still be their right to make that decision? Definitely, because the, the third principle of the Mental Capacity Act is that people are allowed to make unwise decisions if they're capacitated. So if somebody understands that um, by having cream cakes at every meal their diabetes is going to be um, poorly managed and the implications of that are for your sight or for you know amputations and all those things that we know go with badly managed diabetes. Um, if they say yeah, that's fine but hey I'm living life I want to eat my cream cakes and I know what the risks are then we have to let people get on with that because that's what you and I would want. But somehow, because somebody maybe is in the early stages of dementia, or somebody is 92, suddenly we think about those people differently, you know? Um, and we shouldn't. You know, the rules we would apply to a 32-year-old should be the same as the rules we apply to a 92-year-old. But they're not, often. Because families step in and go, Mum, you shouldn't be eating, eating cream cakes. Look, she doesn't understand. She understands fully. She just, she just doesn't care. She just doesn't care. <laughs> Absolutely, she just doesn't care. Yeah. Do you think that's maybe where some of the, the disconnect has been between social workers and doctors or medical professionals who maybe have different ideas about that person's care? Yeah, uh, because I think we, we come at risk from different perspectives. Um, although um, the Parliamentary Select Committee that reported on the Mental Capacity Act back in 2015, when it was 10 years old, um, said that in general practitioners are too risk averse. Um, I think we've got even different layers of how risk averse practitioners are, and I think social workers are, are, are good at thinking about risk and thinking about people's rights to take risks. I think they're better at it than maybe um, medical um, staff are because um, there's quite a paternalistic kind of approach to, to healthcare. Um, there seems to be, why don't people understand that this thing's bad for their health or that thing's bad for their health? And actually now they're in hospital and we've got a bit of control with them. Let's see if we can kind of, let's put them right, you know, and, and, and tell them they can't drink as much as they're drinking or smoke or they can't eat the cream cakes or whatever it happens to be. So I think, um, I think, generally speaking and this is a huge generalization you've got to accept that this is a huge generalization i think when people are in hospitals and we're looking at discharge plan to get them out of hospitals i think people working in those hospitals want to eliminate risk and you can't eliminate risk you can only manage risk so i suppose their specialism is health so yeah. they want to yeah. safeguard somebody's they want health to maximize that person's health whereas yeah. the social worker coming in to support them is actually about safeguarding their well-being is that maximizing fair? their life yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, wants to protect their well-being in general, and um, you know, I don't know about you, but one of my one of my favourite self-care tactics is on a Friday night I uncork the bottle of red wine and I drink three or four glasses of that red wine. Now I know that when I'm uncorking it, 
that I'm going to wake up on a Saturday morning and think that was a bad decision. Yeah, yeah. and then unit-wise, you but should speak. Yeah, absolutely, that all, all of that stuff, all of that stuff, which, which, which I completely know. But what I know is, what I know is that actually I quite enjoy that and I get some benefit from it. And you make an informed decision. And I'm making an informed choice, absolutely, about that. Um, so, and, and I think people have to have to make those decisions for themselves and stand or fall by those decisions. So, in terms of practitioners working on the ground with people, um, whether that be in ABS education, where that would be with their families, yeah. those members that we've got who are social workers yeah. and are working yeah. out in the field, is there something about that group of people that, that you think stops them from being able to, to do that? looking after their own needs like a bottle of wine on a Friday mm-hmm. night or being able to go this is a decision I'm making I think I think one of the problems with that is people. Firstly, they don't prioritise it. They don't see it as being imp- as important as 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 other things. Um, the red wine example is is a good example because I like to think of self care as positive and negative self care. And the red wine example is negative self care because we know that's not self care really because it's going to have a negative impact on your productivity the next day. Um, so I think people don't prioritise it because they don't realise. They don't realise the, the the enormity of the impact that it can actually that it can actually have on you. Um, I think the impact that even small amounts of, of uh, self care can have um, are, are huge. You know, there's, there's there's been some research again that I've written about um, in something around meditation for cash that says um, if you start to meditate re- regularly, even after a very short period of time, even just kind of you know 10, 15 minutes a day for a short period of time. The, 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 the characteristics in your brain start to change um, and you start being able to cope with things better and that's just from doing a little bit of it now if you tie in figure out how to have um, uh, clean good quality sleep you tie in a little bit of exercise you tie in a little bit of nutritional balance there you tie all of those things together and suddenly um, suddenly you're, you're feeling um, much more positive. You're waking up feeling better. Um, you, you're more productive overall. Um, but these things don't feel very. These things to people don't feel very significant. They don't feel. I don't think people don't realise the, the positive impact that it can have. And I know, just to give you an example, I know that if I get up in the morning and go for a run with the dog, um, which is not really a run because she stops and sniffs or wees about every. 20 meters so so it's not really a run but I'll run a bit and then I'll stop with her then run a bit I know that when it's I the only way I could do it <laughs> <laughs> well and, 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 and I, I'll make uh, there's an interesting point to pick up on there but when I do that I know that when I get to work and I'm delivering a lecture at 10 o'clock I know that I'm absolutely nailing it my memory's better I'm more focused because I, I like to think of it as I've got everything going I've got my whole body going. I've kind of, you know, but it is to do with the release of particular chemicals and particular hormones in your body because of the benefits of exercise. Yeah, but one of the important things that, that we need to realise for for self care is we're not talk, when when I talk about um, when I talk about nutrition to people, I, I try and avoid the word diet because I think that has too many connotations. When we talk about nutrition. Um, we're not talking about slimming. We're not talking about being size eight or having a thirty-inch waist or whatever. We're talking about just effective nutrition um, to support your body. When we talk about exercise, we're not talking about going and running marathons. We're not even talking about going and running park run on a Saturday morning, which is five k. We're not even talking about that. We're just talking about um, some exercise that leaves you just a little bit breathless for maybe 20 minutes, half an hour every And would day. you say that that's still important for professionals and um, for example in care homes where actually mm-hmm. the job's really, really physical mm-hmm. do you think it's important to have good exercise so, sort of stuff that is a specific space and time yeah. that that happens rather yeah. than it just being yeah, day to day and it being built in maybe a bit like it was in the olden days before yeah. people did exercise yeah. for fun Absolutely, no. I think I think it is. Um, I think it is because I like to think of, of walking and running, or even going to the gym. Those kind of things. I like to think of those as meditation in motion. Yeah. So you kind of. I I know that when I go out for a run, I pretty much switch off to everything else. Yeah. I just go out, and it's great for this. I just go out and I put one foot in front of the other, 
and I go out and I come back and while I'm out I think there's very little but one of the interesting things is that lots of people have written about in terms of productivity and creativity is that when you stop thinking about things that's when you have your moment that's when you have a flash of inspiration about something when you are not actively thinking about it when you are not trying your hardest to fix a problem yeah, so you, you find things when you've stopped looking for them don't you when you've lost your keys <laughs> you do you do they, ju- they just turn them, up yeah appear. yeah and and you know um i can remember quite vividly times going out for a run and while i was out for a run this is when i was a practitioner when i was out for a run suddenly something would pop into my head and go oh that's what i need to say to that daughter or that son that'll offer them some reassurance or oh yeah that's the thing that's the thing that's going to make a change in that person so it'll help them kind of transition in their life suddenly it just pops into your head because you've created space um, you know you've created space to kind of let your brain do what your brain's good at doing which is just kind of figuring things out when you're not really thinking about it very much so that's not always going to be exercise is it so no. and, and anyone who, who knows me in real life will want to get joints really easily so exercise is something i've got to be really conscious of yeah. um and for me that stuff is sitting down and doing some drawing or mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. having a bit of a sing in the car or doing yeah. something that lets us just not think for yeah. a bit and, yeah. and think about something really all-consuming but quite yeah. banal in, in some ways and that's what i really love about mindfulness that, that, that it, it doesn't really matter what you're doing as long as you engage in it 100 percent. so that's your focus you're mindfully i've got i, I don't know what you like these but i like these little coloring books you know the little kind of mindful co- i love those because you're just coloring in and you're not thinking about anything other than what color am i going to use next and that helps you kind of switch off and that helps you relax so it's that i play guitar so i'll just sit and noodle on my guitar for ages i'll do that kind of thing and just absorb myself in that some people paint to do that yeah all of those all of those things are, are absolutely just as valid because in all of those things you are just being in that moment to the exclusion of everything else which has loads of loads of benefits not only are inspirational ideas popping in your head but also you're just allowing yourself to switch off and disconnect one of the big problems in social work are people going home on a Friday night and then spending all weekend thinking about what's coming on on Monday morning you know so you've got to find ways to kind of you've got to find ways to switch off and some of these ways are simpler than you think they are yeah and I think what you said there was really interesting in that when I think of mindfulness I think of that as being a very specific thing you do some mindfulness which is actually that meditation as an activity Mm. but what you're saying is actually that you think of mindfulness as a state of mind whilst you do something that Mm -hmm. interests you I I think for me mindfulness is applying yourself singly to a particular to a particular task Um, and and I know people who even use mindfulness to unravel a problem at work you know um, in the shower thinking about what you've got coming up that day that you're kind of concerned about just think exclusively about that let the feelings wash over you understand how it's going to make you feel emotionally but singularly focus on that I think people have that's got, hard in 2019 though isn't absolutely it? <laughs> without without a, without a doubt uh, and, and that I guess that kind of that, that that leads into thinking about there's lots of great ideas about, about how to be productive and um, one of the things that, that I'm really into um, is this idea of having a trusted system where everything resides. Everything that you have in your sphere of responsibility, that I like to call it, everything that's in your sphere of responsibility um, is recorded somewhere so that you're not um, keeping everything in your head. David, David Allen, who... Um, one of my favourite books, get the Getting Things Done methodology. David Allen says that, uh, that that your mind, your brain, is not a storage tool. It's a thinking tool. It's not good at storing things, really, because we forget things all the time. That's not what it's for. It's for thinking about things, and you've got to do what psychologists call externalising your memories. Write them down. Put them in a spreadsheet. Put them in a word document. Do whatever you want with them. Put them in your calendar. Because if you get everything out of your head. Um, in such a way that when you need to do that thing you will be reminded to do it and you're not constantly having again what David Allen calls open loops in your head open loops things just go round and round in your head 
all the time um, because you're desperately trying to remember it while you're doing the other three things that you're desperately trying to do. Um, the risk is you forget what it was you've got in your head as an open loop, but every open loop you've got going around in your head um, saps your psychological capacity to remain in the moment with that one thing that you have to think about or do at that point in time. So you get you need to get all of that out of your head. So um, it, uh, it's useful for me because my memory's appalling. So that's that's probably why I kind of bought into it because my memory's not good. I'm a perfect example of that. So all of my stuff that I need to do, everything that's including in my personal life, everything is either in my calendar or in a spreadsheet somewhere. Um, and I have a routine of checking those places every day in the morning, every day in the afternoon, big session on a Friday or last day of the week, whatever that is for you. Um, because now I don't have to remember anything. So if I want to absorb myself into writing the latest Cash Alumni article, I can just think, right, I've got this three hours to do this. I don't have to think about anything else because I've checked my calendar, checked my diary. There's nothing else to do, nothing else in my my sphere of responsibility there's nothing else I need to do so I'm just going to write this so that's that's a theory that I think probably echoes in loads of different it's professions fantastic. around the yeah, world and, of course and, it does yeah. um, I think it also plays a little bit into this idea of the sort of undervaluing of those other places so like you know we know that that, that there is an undervalue placed on the, the person who stays at home to look after yeah. their household I think that translates really well into social care and into social work because a lot of those soft skills and those people skills and the what people think of as being the hippy dippy stuff mm -hmm. um, isn't valued by wider society in the way that it should. I mean, do, do you think that that's something that's still an issue within social work that people don't understand how much it's needed or, or, or what it actually is? People don't get what we do. Okay, you so know? putting you on the spot. Yeah. What? What is it? What? What is What's social work? What, what, what is we... it that you do? Well, and I think I think we've kind of we've mentioned this earlier is that I think we um, invest ourselves in a way that other professions don't necessarily. And I'm sure there are some nurses out there that invest themselves, but it, but it, but, but not all. I don't think it's a different way. It's, isn't a, it? it's, it's in a, a different way. Yeah. I think we invest ourselves emotionally in other people's worlds. Um, and what I think is that it's not what we do, it's how we do it. It's how we approach people. It's how we give people space and time to explore themselves. And I'm talking probably quite idealistically here. In an ideal world, that's what social work would do. But often, those extrinsic motivators like time scales and managing our diary to fit everything in press in on us and mean we probably often don't do that. But I think that's our unique contribution. The way we do things, not necessarily what we do, we do things differently to other people. Um, hold the person at the center. A uh, friend of mine who's a doctor said, the problem with in medicine is we treat the symptoms, not the person. And I think that kind of yeah. reflected, you, you, you see a set of symptoms, and we've got a solution for that set of symptoms. Um, in social work, we don't really treat the symptoms, what we look for is what's the meaning in those symptoms maybe, but also what's behind that, what's got us to this point where you're in this position, so, trying to understand that. So do you think there's a parallel where actually social workers are a little bit like account managers in that they look at not solving the problem that the customer presents them with, mm -hmm. but sort of using that five whys and getting to what actually may be the cause of that yeah. and what that person thinks is the cause of their problem and what the fix is yeah. wouldn't actually fix the problem it would fix the problem they think they've got rather than the problem that's actually there yeah but because I think because I think a lot of the time I mean probably particularly in, in, in worlds in kind of world of, of, of mental health or substance misuse probably you know um, it's getting at the root cause of those things isn't it you know because you can in theory, you can fix depression by giving a tablet, but you haven't really fixed it. You've just masked the symptoms in some way and chemically made someone feel better. You haven't got to the back of why were you depressed in the first place, yeah? If somebody's misusing you know, alcohol or cocaine or whatever, um, and you, you, you somehow kind of manage that in some way, you've not got at the root cause of of why it is that they misused alcohol. I mean, the two things go hand in hand, don't they? Often substance misuse and 
mental health issues and one's often kind of masking the other. So I think social workers are, are good at trying to help people themselves get at what, what is the root cause of, of, of why you are in the position you're, you're currently in. And skipping back sort of between the, the two themes of social work as a whole and the self-care stuff, you mentioned there that there are people who may abuse mm. cocaine and mm. alcohol, obviously, mm. in the public consciousness, those are two very different things. People who abuse mm. cocaine and people who abuse alcohol, that's two different levels because one's yeah. legal, one's well. not. C- can you tell her a little bit about using everyday drugs like alcohol and the other ones oh, that you've right. written about? Are and, we talking and, and caffeine? That, that, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, the, and the world's caffeine addiction. I can't even remember where this is from now. But I remember reading somewhere that somebody said, if you if you drink alcohol on a night, you're stealing hours from tomorrow. And if you drink coffee on a morning, you're stealing hours from later in the day. What we know is that these kind of things, put, and alcohol's the same, and, and, and other drugs, it puts our bodies under a stress. And um, that physical, there's a physical response to the stress that puts our bodies under that, in a sense, in many ways, chemically, is, is very similar to the stress we feel sat at the desk with four or five different deadlines. So you're sat at your desk with four or five different deadlines, not knowing what you want to do first, and you're having your fifth cup of coffee for the day, all of that is putting your body under stress. And do you think that affects how people then deal with those four or five different deadlines or problems, if, if they're all so... Wired. in a sort of fight or flight, yeah, like that, that wired sort of state. Do you I think that they actually deal with those problems differently? I, th- I think uh, I think you're in a uh, chemically induced heightened state of awareness and I find thinking back at the time like any like any person who's misusing the drug I would have told you it helped me stay focused it helped me get on with things but I think um, I think thinking back um, it probably meant that my thinking was quite scattered, that I wasn't thinking things through rationally and logically. I was probably just grabbing at something because I was so wired. I was like, I'll get this done, plow through. And I don't think that's your kind of best work sometimes. And, and just for anybody who doesn't know you, I do want to reassure everybody that you do do an awful lot of stuff and that actually you're one of those people that, that, that if they do decide to look you up after, yeah. after they've, they've listened to this, that they'll find that you've got five different jobs and careers <laughs> and lives that, that you run and that yeah. actually everything's really well managed and you seem to just do loads and um, do you think that that's different now than it was before you had these sort of systems and self care processes in place? Yes, the reason I am obsessed with being organised and the impact that and all the self care stuff has on productivity is I was the most disorganised person that you could care to imagine leaving stuff right till the last minute, stopping at work till you know late to get the report done because it needed to be there that day. So at five o'clock I'm starting to write the report that's due that day. It's a bit like students, students who leave stuff till the final day it's due in, you know, and they hand it in and they get it in on time. But you think, is it your best work? Probably not going to be because you don't have time to go back and reevaluate and proofread and do all those kind of things that you want to do. So yes, absolutely. Um, I, I don't think. I think one of the reasons that I've started taking on other roles is because because I got myself really focused and really organised in my kind of day job, if you like, which I see as the university, that's my core, that's my core job, three days a week I do that. Because I got myself so organised at that, what I found was, was, was actually it freed up, it doesn't necessarily free up time, okay, that, that's not the bonus for me, it frees up the psychological capacity to start to think about other things. So suddenly I'm sat at work and I'm thinking, could I write a blog? Could I do a podcast? Could I write for you guys? Could I do these kind of things? Well, yeah, I could. Not because I had more time, because I think it doesn't matter where you work. Social work is not the only profession that's really busy. We're all really busy. We, we live in a workplace environment that is all about do more with less. But it is very, very possible to be very busy and to get very little done. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, without a doubt. Have you ever, have you ever, have you ever sat at your desk and worked all day and thought, I don't think I've really achieved anything? But we all feel that, don't we? And and that's because I think sometimes we just push things around all day. 
we don't focus on what's my next task, what's the next thing I need to do, what am I aiming for at the end, where have I moved to? Or, or it might be that, that we've done something that I know that you don't like, um, which is that we've done part of a lot of things, so we haven't finished anything, we've just well, done a bit of a lot of different things. Au contraire, au contraire, no, I, I would disagree with you there because I do like that, but it has to be planned. So what you have to do, this is this is this is this thing about how do you eat an elephant, okay? Uh, you eat an elephant in one bite at a time because you couldn't possibly eat a whole elephant all at once. So when you've got a big task, you break it down into smaller tasks. But I think what you're maybe alluding to is people don't break it down into small tasks, they just chip away at the bigger task. So instead of sitting down and thinking I've got this big task to do, I've got to I've got to initiate and record a podcast. Okay. So instead of breaking that down into, have I got the right equipment, who am I going to talk to, let's organise some diary appointments to do that. If you break it down into those tasks, rather than thinking the end result is a podcast, then it's a thing called, a psychological thing called the power of small wins. So if, you, if the task is record a podcast, you only get that psychological buzz that makes you feel like you've achieved something when you've recorded the podcast. But if you break it down into nine steps... Every time you take off one of those steps in your calendar, you get a buzz because you have actually completed something. You've completed step one, and then you move on to step two. And I would diary all of those steps so I know when it's going to happen to get to the end product. And that's different to multitasking, isn't it? The, uh, um, yes. Um, yes, that's different to multitasking, very much so. Multitasking doesn't work. Um, simple. Um, single tasking is what we're after. The research evidence is that none of us can multitask effectively. That's the evidence. Um, and there's research around that. There's a great piece of research that was done for Microsoft, um, which showed that if someone's on task, so with Microsoft it would be computer programming, so ingenious thing. If they were if, if they've got their emails open and one of their emails pops up and they think I'll have a look at that email, they go off and look at their email read it, respond, but maybe then they come back to the task, it can take up to 20 minutes to get back up to speed on that task again, because you're changing between things, because you, your brain can only cope with one thing at once you're not doing two things at once so you feel like you are, you're doing a bit of this thing, then a bit of this thing then a bit of this thing, then a bit of this thing, but all the time, um, all the time you're risking increased, mistra- increased mistakes, and actually a reduction in how fast you complete that task um, do you want to try an example? Yeah, go on. Then. Okay, you've got to do it. So what I want you to do is what I want you to do is just count from one to ten. Okay. Out loud. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right now, say the first ten letters of the alphabet. A B C D E F G H I J. Right, so I now want you to intersperse them, so I want you to do both things at once. So I want you to go 1, A, 2, B, 3, C, etc. and then keep going. 1, A, 2, B, 3, C, 4, D, 5, E, 6, F, 7, G. <laughs> oh, that's much harder. Of course it is, <laughs> because I would imagine what you were doing, because when I do that, what I have to do, once, once you get past those first few letters, which we all know, instinctively A, B, C, D, F, G yeah once you do those first ones you do it instinctively once you get further down the alphabet I bet what you were doing was starting at the start of the alphabet again almost to get the, the way you needed to be that's what I, that's how I do it anyway I say I did it slightly differently and then I was keeping track of numbers on my hand I was trying to remember where I was in the alphabet oh, I didn't tell you you'd use your hands I didn't tell you that it was just as difficult <laughs> So that, that's you trying to multitask, trying to do two things at once, using your brain the way we do when we multitask, which is we do a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of that. And, and you will slow down. And, and I've, 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 I've done that with a number of people, and some people are really good at it, and they get kind of two-thirds they of the way. Code breakers, it, well, probably, yeah. They get two-thirds of the way through the alphabet before you, there's a tangible slowing. But there nevertheless is a slowing. Yeah. So some of us, I guess, might be better than others at switching between tasks, but... For all of us, there's a psychological payoff of, of keeping so two tasks. So how do people going. overcome that? Because obviously, in in the world that we've got now, that there, there are loads of different pressures and loads of different things coming from different directions. So how do you set yourself up to not multitask? To not need to multitask? Easy. You can't plan and do at the same time. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 the first thing that we need to think is. 
You can't plan and do it at the same time, so you have to have a structure in your day that you work to. Now, what I would say is, when you start working this way, it feels a little alien and a bit odd and a bit unusual. And what I'm going to suggest to you is, you start the day with half an hour of planning every day and you'll think I haven't got time to set aside half an hour but what you'll find is if you plan your tasks for the day and then execute those tasks one after the other by just going into your calendar and thinking I've got this amount of time to do this or I'll do that next job next job next job you will work through those tasks faster Um, and then you plan at the end of the day for the following day yeah and then the following day you have another look at your plan and you plan anything else that's cropped up in the meantime, do that Tuesday afternoon, etc. And then one of the big mistakes people make, it's funny, just before you came today, I was reading this thing about productivity and it was saying that the two least productive days of the week are, go on, have a guess. Monday and Friday. Monday and Friday. They're the two least productive parts of the parts of the week. For people that work Monday and Friday, obviously. Um, yeah, the first one and the last one. Yeah, first one and the last one. Um, the, the reason Friday is, is a low productivity day it is because you're about to hit your time so productivity productivity slides on a Friday and it, it then escalates on a Monday and one of the reasons it escalates on a Monday is because you're getting back into your job and you're doing all your planning on a Monday all of it for what you're going to do that week now my take on that is do all of that planning on a Friday afternoon when your productivity is already on the slide so you're not going to get as much done anyway because you're not going to write that report because you'll do it next week because hey it's Friday yeah so if you spend that time planning which is actually quite a nice kind of cathartic exercise you're having a look a week ahead I always go at least a fortnight ahead I sometimes go a month ahead you know if I've got the time always go a fortnight ahead I work back breaking down me big elephants into smaller tasks diary and all those kind of things and I do that on a Friday afternoon well I, I I don't for me it's a Wednesday afternoon because that's when I finished the university and what that means is when I get to work on a Monday morning I only need me brief planning period because really it's already planned me planning on a Monday is just checking out the plan making sure the plan still fits I'll check my emails as well while I'm doing this bit of planning just has anything else cropped up that I need to fit in somewhere so I've done all that but I'm not planning from scratch the week's already pretty much planned I can see where my pockets of time are if I need to do anything else Um, I can see where the pinch points are in the week where I can't manage anything else I can see all of that but actually I saw it all on Friday and by doing that on a Friday afternoon I can come home with a kind of clear head thinking next week's sorted Um, so what that means is if you've got all of that planned and you've thought all of that through and you know the stuff that's fixed and you know the stuff that's movable when you get into work on a Monday morning and bomb X has hit your world you can immediately go to your week and think right well these things are removable actually that thing could move and I can actually move that into next week it would have just been nice if I'd done it this week so there's me time Tuesday afternoon's me time I can do this thing on Tuesday afternoon yeah the luxury of that and the reason I encourage professionals to do that is is because then if you absolutely can't do this thing because your diary is full of everything that you need to do I'll come back to that then you can legitimately go to your manager and go this thing you've given me doesn't fit come and have a look at my diary this is what I've got to do but I've been through this with social workers where I've said I want you to do this and they've gone I can't possibly find the time to do that I've got a busy week and he says show me your diary and because all people tend to routinely diary out all their visits the times that they're going to go somewhere yeah they're going to physically leave the office or they're they're in a, a meeting people just diary those things they don't diary two hours on a Monday afternoon to write that report 15 minutes to phone that doctor about whatever it is they don't diary those things out you're presented with this diary that looks empty so as a manager you kind of go well it looks like you've got all of this time and they're handing the problem back to you now my big thing is let's not let managers off the hook with making tough decisions about the priority of your work so if you've broken down all your big elephants into smaller tasks and you've figured out that you need to write this report then or research this information then to write this report two days later if you've diaried all of that out then suddenly your manager can think wow yeah you are busy I still need you to do it so don't do that thing or yeah I get you 
I'll give that to somebody else to do. This, I like to think of this as a whole life solution, okay? Because I've got this thing, people talk about work-life balance all the time, and uh, I may well have said this to you before, it doesn't exist. This idea of work-life balance is dragging us into a debate between our work self and our home self that yeah. is actually uh, detrimental to us because all of that is life. We need to not manage our work-life balance but simply balance our life, yeah? Um, so that means your diary when you're gonna go for a run, your diary, sadly, in my world, your diary when you're gonna binge watch Orange is the New Black or whatever it happens to be, your diary those things so that you then think, what am I doing today? Oh, that's what we're doing. I'm sitting my backside on the couch with a big bar of chocolate. And it doesn't and have to be that. that specific, does it? It just needs to be, this is the time that yeah. I'm going to it, sit on the city and spend some time with this person. Yeah. Or this is the time I'm going to yeah. look after myself a it little bit. It can be if you're not quite as obsessed as I am with this kind of thing. Yeah, it could be. Because that's important, and, and there's, there's also lots of evidence that says simply by writing something down makes it more likely to happen. So if you've got your diary and you write in your diary, that's my four hours where I'm going to sit and read the paper, read a book, and then I'm going to go for a walk, and then I'm going to do whatever. You don't necessarily have to have diaried all those things out, but just diarying out the fact that those are your four hours, they're protected, they're just for you, means it's more likely that it will happen. It might not, because something might creep in where you've got to move it, but it'll, it's more likely to kind of to happen. It's the same as, it's the same as, um, it's the same to go to the gym. If you book into a class, you're more likely to go than if you think, oh, this week I might go to the gym at some point and just do some machines, weights machines, I might do that. That probably won't happen, but if you book into the class and make a commitment, even better if you make a commitment to go with somebody else it's more likely to happen. So the more you do, the more, there's a thing in productivity just called nudges. The more nudges you give yourself, the more likely things are to happen. I use my phone all the time to nudge myself into action. So if I'm, for example, I think this is a great little productivity hack. If, I'm, what, if I need to write a lecture or write a report, and I've set myself two hours aside to write that report, what I found I used to do was, after a, after a period of time, that I can't even put my finger on. I'd start to check me watch every 10 or 15 minutes, distracting me from the task. Now what I do is just set a countdown on my phone for one hour 50. So when that goes off, I know I've just got 10 minutes left. So I can completely forget about the fact that I need to be at the next thing. So you're not, you're not worrying about So I'm not worrying about, about the next thing all the time. Absolutely. So I can completely get absorbed in it because something else is going to tell me that it's time to not be absorbed in this thing anymore. And the more we can kind of do that, the more we can just channel ourselves singularly into the item that we're busy working on, the more chance we have of, of applying ourselves to that um, as fully as we possibly can. That's really exciting. Um, and we know that if people wanted to find out more about self-care or any of those sort of cornerstones that you've talked about, um, a pro productivity system where they can mm. sort of look at all of that stuff that you've got, um, the Social Work Thoughts blog, yeah. um, but now there's also a Social Work Thoughts podcast there which is. people can find on yeah. iTunes or Podbean. They can, that's right, yes. Um, which is excellent. Yeah. And obviously we've got three amazing series by you in the Cash Alumni stuff. So we've yeah. got um, the stuff around organisation and self-care yeah. and we've got legislation explained yeah. amongst the other stuff. So that touches on the things that we've yeah, talked about so does. far. Yeah. Um, if you were to leave our audience with one thing, what, what is what, what is your most important point? What is it that you, you would like every social worker or everyone working in social care to sort of carry with them? Over everything is uh, prioritise yourself, because if you don't prioritise yourself, you're not working effectively with other people. So is it that life mask on a plane next time? Absolutely, yes, perfect, it is, it is. If you're not, looking after yourself then you can't give what you need to give to support and help other people well thank you very much for talking to us today You're um and as i say if you can check it out on our website yeah. um, which is cashalumni.org.uk yeah. through your social work shorts podcast yeah. or the blog that goes alongside of that and where yeah. can people find that that's at uh, socialworkshorts.co.uk excellent well that's nice and easy to remember yeah um and we'll speak to you again soon so thank thanks you. very much for your time pleasure
And thanks to you at home or on the go for joining us. Don't forget, if you've got some best practice or you'd like to share with us um, something great, um, you can get in touch with us at alumni at cash.org.uk. That's alumni, A-L-U-M-N-I, at cash, C-A-C-H-E for echo, dot org dot uk. And we'd love to speak to you. You can find us at the Cash Alumni website at www.cashalumni.org.uk or through the main Cash website for information about qualifications and other CPD at www.cachevecho.org.uk. Thanks very much and until next time, take care.